Today my guest on Tete a Tete is Peter Blackburn. Peter is now an independent theatre director, although he's done some other work as well. Peter actually came through the acting stream and we're going to talk about how he made that transition and what it is about directing that he particularly enjoys. Peter, thank you so much for coming along today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. You started out through the acting track, but before that you studied other things at university, didn't you? I mean, I started like many people at high school, got mm. the acting bug. Then I uh, went, went on to study at university while I had an agent and was doing the acting, the gigging, gigging uh, as an actor. Okay, so you were actually acting while you are at university? I was. Oh, good I for was. you. And then had the uh, ultimatum put to me of, you know, either you choose acting or you choose finishing your degree, you can't have both. Uh, I chose to continue studying. Probably because I also didn't like being put in a position where I had to make the choice. I'm a pretty stubborn kind of guy. <laughs> but I had some pretty awful experiences that made me kind of make that decision to be the kind of director that I am, working with actors as well, having been an actor treated not well. So what sort of work were you doing when you were at university? Mostly ads and yep. commercials, mm -hmm. uh, commercial work. I would often get very close to a, a part in a series or something else that was a little more interesting and I would be the, the final person and never quite getting across the line. And I don't think I had the resilience, fortitude, ultimately the, the, um, the, the passion to continue with mm. acting. It just didn't quite get to that point for you. So I was often being told, you know, you're not good looking enough to play the lead, but you're too good looking to play the uh, best friend character or you're a character actor but you don't look like a character actor so no one knew kind of how to fit. I just love being in a room and rehearsing and I take responsibility as well through um, lack of persistence and kind of making those opportunities. I didn't have the skill to know how to make those opportunities mm. in a town that didn't have a thriving independent scene right. in the same way that I think Melbourne does right. um, and so yeah I, I decided to put my focus my energies into, into academia. So you then went on and became uh, an English teacher? I, well, yes I was, I was an English teacher for seven years um, and I taught, uh, taught across a, a wide spectrum of uh, environments but mostly I taught at-risk students, so students who've been kicked out of high school uh, and I worked with, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, with um, gifted and talented students who were at um, selective high schools or were trying to get into the selective high schools. Mm -hmm. So I worked in that environment for about five years and then I taught in the UK for two years. I taught media and, and English mm -hmm. literature. What do you think you've brought from that teaching experience into your directing experience now? That's a very good question uh, and it formed uh, my master's thesis was actually on that very topic. Um, <laughs> so there is um, a lot about of, from my teaching career that I've brought into my directing. Because but, but what is it? What, well, yeah. Yeah. A couple of things teaching has given me. Um, one is it doesn't matter what you know, it only matters what you can communicate. Yeah, and that's, it's, you know, I learnt that working with at-risk students. It matters what I can, can how I can connect to you. Yes. And that's helped in the sense of what it, it means uh, in a rehearsal room on set um, to go, it doesn't matter, I can't get frustrated if you don't understand what I'm trying to say. I have to get better at explaining that. Um, no one has a bigger ego than an adolescent child. And so m my ego, what, what it was, and it probably was unhealthy at certain stages in my life, I learnt to be more generous as a human being and realise that the work is, is more important than, uh, than me. And I, and I think ultimately that's what moved me into directing rather than acting, is that I'm, a better, I'm better in service than I am uh, in the spotlight. Oh, wow, that's a really interesting answer. Thank you. Um, and I think there's a, there's a sense of um, patience that sits around what you're saying too. Being able to say, okay, I, I've got the bigger picture in mind. I know where we're going. Yeah. So I don't have to achieve this right now. I can, I can work with people and, and move around and get what I want. Yeah, I, th I think so. And also just, you know, seven years of um, articulating and being uh, and and listening and uh, understanding, finding out what uh, other people, in this case, young people, 
understand and, and know and learn to listen. And I think a lot of um, a lot of directors might find their own way to w towards that. Um, but for me, it was through teaching that was a, that was that really held a mirror up to that, and I, I was able to understand on a molecular level. It makes sense. It's not good because it's because I'm, I'm a nice person or because I'm hot. You know, that might be a result. It's because it works. For me, it's I don't I, I genuinely don't know what the end product is going to be on a production. You know, be it film theatre, television, whatever I happen to be working on, I, I don't know. And it's a, it's a genuine collaboration then. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. Do, you know, how much shaping do you have in your mind at the start and how much is it very much a collaborative journey for you? Uh, when I studied directing at VCA, mm -hmm. um, I had uh, some mentors say that I'm, I'm very prescriptive and very... Uh, uh, very much have a vision and that mm. I am able to articulate to actors how to fit that and I don't see it that way. It's interesting <laughs> being on the inside of that. Um, I think I'm clear, I think I have an idea of, of how to generate ideas and how to explore the material but I genuinely don't see the production out here somewhere and then I am trying to fit people into that. I know how to ask the right questions. Uh, how do I provoke the interest and the um, creativity in you so that we can help create this mm. together. Mm. With teaching there is a, a pedagogical mm. and um, a difference of authority mm. um, that is somewhat retained as a director but much less so. It's a collegial environment. I am working with actors who are, and artists who are better at what they do than I am and if I as a director um, have to kind of hold those different um, artistic views and you know I, I talk about myself as a curator I'm just selecting the best bits that somebody else offers me mm -hmm. it's not I don't pres um, subscribe to this belief of, as the director as you know the one person whose genius creates yeah. it so when a text comes to you what are the first things that you do to to say yeah okay I've got a vision for this I think I can contribute something to it uh, I've, I've certainly turned away uh, far fewer texts than I've said yes to, but for me um, there has to be a sense that I, I can do this. I know I know um, it can scare me, and I can be, um, you know, I can certainly feel like it should be uh, slightly out of reach. Um, but it shouldn't feel completely alien and something that I definitely know that I can't do. If I, it's something I know that it's not within my realm. And if I don't understand a text, which can happen, I have worked a lot in a lot of different um, forms and genres, but there's sometimes I just go, I genuinely don't understand this and I'm not the person therefore to... Because it must be quite intense for you. Absolutely. So, so give me an example of, of a production you've, you've done and how long has it been in your life? I often get very challenging material. So it's often dark material, it's often murder, rape, uh, serial killers, mm. <laughs> AIDS, <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of heavy subjects. Mm. Um, and I think, I hope, it's just because I've kind of developed a reputation that I can kind of uh, hold that. I can kind of be present to that and um, know when it's appropriate to be relaxed and laugh and 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 also know when it's time to really sit in the weight yeah. of the text. Yeah. Um, occasionally, someone will give me just a pure a pure comedy or something, and <laughs> doing one soon actually, and it's like ah, oh, very joyful. And so I suppose I did one of the s the second production I did was The Boys, which is an Australian play about the rape, murder, and abduction of Anita Copy. And um, so that process was probably three to four months from being asked to do it to um, opening night. And a good two months of that was, was in the rehearsal room, mm. I would say. Sometimes it, we, I don't get that luxury of spending that much time um, with a text. Um, I did a show called Filtrum last year th with North of Eight. I had four weeks and we had four weeks from where to go on that one and it was a new Australian work with a cast of nine but I ended up being really proud of that show because we were able to create a um, you know, we were able to create a very immersive world mm. in a very short period of time. Um, how did you achieve that? 
So I've been in learning environments for a long time and in the last decade particularly, I've been in pretty intensive um, actor training and uh, theatre making environments. So I've listened well and I've been a good student as well as a practical um, maker. And so I, I've got a um, quite a broad um, process mm -hmm. that I can, I can um, bring in a lot of tools and I can underst I understand and can speak a lot of different languages that mm. actors have trained in because I've been in a lot of actor training environments because of my English uh, background and academic background, um, my script analysis, mm. I think working on uh, text and being able to uh, make that a living process. Mm. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, the other thing that I bring into my rehearsals is improv. I worked uh, with Rob Marchand on uh, the Michael Lee process at a really pivotal um, point in my career. And so I will um, often use uh, improvisation as a way to explore the world of the text, characters, but then as I say, a million other tiny little influences from other people creep in yeah. to my... Depending on what you need from the text. Exactly. Uh, I, I want a, a text to always speak to me and always yeah. be responding to it. Um, and I guess one of the great things about teaching acting and being in a lot of actor training environments now um, is that I, I can try something new and I can go, that worked mm -hmm. or that didn't. I can always, I always tend to be able to make something productive even if I go I don't want to use that again at least I've kind of learned something from it and it means that um, my process doesn't remain static I'm yes constantly which is involved. important yeah um, you mentioned that a lot of the work that you're dealing with is quite heavy and and um, emotionally draining work what is the role of the director in looking after the actors who are going through that I always take care of the actor mm. I think it's important it's vital um, I don't know if there's a perfect uh, response, I, and, and I've, I've again I've learnt uh, a lot on my journey um, where the responsibility lies. It's important not to to overstretch those boundaries and to say there is a point at which you're not a therapist. Sometimes it's okay to be uh, able to point the actor or other person, writer, whoever, whoever it might be, somewhere else if they need to. Um, th to help them with self-care. Your involvement can actually be just as triggering. Nine times out of ten, I am the person to do that, and I can, and I can hold that. Um, so a couple of things is just being willing to talk yes. and be not being running out the door, especially after, yes. after an intense scene. Uh, again, listen to what's going on for the actor. To name that you're doing triggering work. Even when I held auditions, I named that we were working on triggering material. Mm. Um, a number of the actors afterwards said thank you so much for naming that because w I was really worried that I was going to this really vulnerable place in a room full of essentially strangers mm -hmm. and then also to just to let actors know that it's okay to seek help. And the other big one is to laugh sometimes, to know when to um, be in the seriousness and to and to hold that and to let the act to, to go it's okay for you the actor now to release because mm. they're holding a lot of tension mm. often um, that happened particularly with uh, with filter from the play that I did last year was about incest and um, and it was there was elements of that story that had touched some people in that space mm. um, and so I had to be able to just allow people to just sit in a rehe in a rehearsal process mm. and not have to fix anything just say let's just sit in this moment and just and then also to know when it's okay to move on mm. and to laugh and to you mm. know to have that release um, that Judy Dench talks about you know the greater the tragedy the more you should laugh in yes. in rehearsals mm, the wonderful Judy Dench mm -hmm. um, we've talked a bit about how you work with actors and and which is wonderful because often directors aren't good at doing that. But what is the full range of things that you as a director hold in your hand? There's a lot of people the director has to communicate with, mm. um, uh, be it from the writer. Um, if you're lucky enough, as I have been, to work with um, living writers, people who are um, working with you in the room or are a phone call away, um, 
when you're working with Shakespeare or Tennessee Williams or someone like that, no, you don't have that opportunity. The text is the text and you have mm -hmm. to work with it. Um, so the writers won, uh, the actors, as you've mentioned, uh, and then the creative team. Um, and it's, it's slightly different, obviously, on a film set to a stage. And I you know, get to work on both, uh, mostly theatre. Uh, having inspiration to be able to speak to um, work that you know, that you have a shared language around, a shared understanding of. For me particularly with film, I uh, have studied film, but from an analytic point of view, from a critical point of view, um, I'm not great with the technical understanding of lenses and uh, speeds and sound and all of that. But I just have people around me who are much better at that and I can talk to them. You're afforded that if you're good at what you do in terms of being able to coordinate people. I'm not a musician either, but I know how to speak to musicians in a way that I get what, what we're doing with the, with the show. And then defer to people's greater knowledge. Um, humility is a very um, underrated quality um, in a director, understanding that you, know, you should surround yourself with people who are smarter and better at what they do yes. than you. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, one of the really critical aspects, of course, is casting. And for people who are on the tricky side of the casting, when you front up and there you are putting your whole self on the line, it's, a very, it's often a very traumatic and difficult experience. Tell me about how you approach it on the other side of the, of the fence. There's, it's traumatic and <laughs> um, for different reasons, mostly because you are the person responsible for, um, you know, uh, however many positive outcomes you get to make, you have a, a, an exponential amount of negative. Uh, and if you, if you go into the audition process it, with a truly open heart, open mind, that you want to be inspired, you want to be wowed by what the actor is bringing. Um, but the reality is that you're going to have to make calls that are going to devastate people and it's terrible because mm. people put a lot of work in to um, what they do. The caveat is that I try to make the experience as uh, fruitful as possible. So I don't tend to run audition processes that are any less than half an hour. Mm, wow. um, but uh, for big roles or roles that they're complicated or highly sought after, I'll often give an hour wow. um, to really give them the biggest opportunity of not just of what of some of the choices that they've made, but also I want to see how they're going to respond to yeah. this weird and wacky thing that I do, which is actually play with the actor yeah, in the yeah. space. And I want to know that they can do that. It, re it really is not uh, often that you could have done anything more as an actor in that mm. space. It just comes down to an X factor. It comes down to somebody having um, a, a, yeah, this a, a chemistry or a um, a, a quirk of their style that is going to fit and going to match. Um, that it, it, like any recruitment process, it's it's often not that you're not wonderful at what you're d you're doing. It's just that it doesn't suit that particular situation. Yeah, or it does suit, and there's somebody else who somehow gave something else. And that's you know, I, I would I would love a world in which I could just pick who you know. A, to not have to make those calls, not have to put people through that. Unfortunately, it's the business, and and I do avoid it sometimes. I often have the luxury of knowing, uh, trusting my gut, and having worked with a lot of actors, and knowing that I can put somebody in who I know can do this role, and I know their work enough to know. Um, uh, and I've developed a language and a trust with them already. There's a reason that a lot of directors tend to build a um, an ensemble of actors that they work with. But it's also important not to get static, as I said before, and stagnant, and you want to bring new people into that. And that's when I make sure that it's a really thorough um, process. Mm. Uh, it's less about their ca capability, their ability, and more about, and when I say quirk, I usually, I mean quirk as in something indefinable, not, I certainly don't want actors cultivating a, <laughs> an eccentricity because they think that's what it, no, a quirk as in a, a, a happenstance of their personality that happens to fit with the, with the role. Um, we've talked, uh, you've mentioned that you, you did a master's in directing. What did you learn in that course about the different ways that people approach directing? 
I learned that the, the idea of an actor's director, which I kind of proudly uh, where it's been bestowed upon me by a lot of uh, actors, um, that it's not uh, the uh, default, yeah. which I know it yeah. should be surprising. It yeah. surprised me. Um, I've I'd heard many many um, stories about that from other actors, mm. but when I was actually in an environment that was uh, training people to do this job that I had naively believed was 90% about working with actors. Other directors are more architectural or more um, experimental or they have their own, they have their own process um, and that can work for a lot of different reasons for a lot of different people. It's not my experience and it's not how I would approach things. But yes, yeah, so that, that's, I learned that, I learned the kind, the different, uh, that there is such a thing as an architectural or aesthetically driven director. You know, one of the great exercises, I talked about being a curator. Um, we, we did an exercise um, where we had a, a list of words that can be attached to the director and we had to uh, get that down to three mm -hmm. and then finally just one word of like what, what best defines our process and there's actually so many different kinds of directors from the from the dictatorial to the educative to the to you know all of this and I as I said I whittled mine down to being a curator why I talk about it as being a curator is after um, creating an environment in which actors are exploring um, I, I very I think I can name on you know one or maybe two hands the amount of times I've blocked a scene in the traditional sense uh -huh. where I've said go you know and but very often for very specific reasons I need a particular shape because it's evocative mm -hmm. um, but most of the time uh, I will just use uh, where the w the choices that the actors make becomes the shaping mm -hmm. I, I use the word shaping not blocking because blocking has connotations um, that um, after a while the shape the show um, will start to have an organic yeah. shape and yeah. obviously like grooves actors tend to then find their way through it but I never want it to be limited mm -hmm. um, but that's what I talk about when I say curating mm -hmm. most of the choices on that stage have not been mine. How much do you like your actors to do something fresh and different every night? Uh, it's essential I think yeah I mean look there's a uh, there's an ideal that Mike Alfred's, um, the great director and acting teacher, talks about, which is different every night. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the great privilege to work with Mike and uh, see him do uh, his work. Uh, and I said, you know, at what, at what stage do you say, okay, now we'll, um, we'll at least call this the shape that, the, and he's, oh, you never say that. <laughs> and to me, that's terrifying. I haven't, I don't think I've quite got to that stage where I can say anything goes in terms of that. But I also, I think that actors will naturally find, as I said before, like they'll find a groove. It will become habit because it's what the character would do. Yes. But I don't think I would ever, if, a, if an actor didn't hit the exact moments or um, if, if they decided to zig when they were going to zag and a night I'd be, it'd be great. It'd be kind of electric mm -hmm. if that happened. If it was not arbitrary, if it wasn't just for the sake of mixing things up, if it was a genuine impulse, then I think that's fantastic and that's when theatre can become really alive. Mm. Um, but I think there's a reason that yeah, those, those shapes begin to formulate. Okay. You've worked in LA. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how that happened <laughs> and what did you do? Yes, I've worked in LA on a couple of occasions now. Um, so I had worked with Larry Moss, um, the famed uh, acting teacher uh, and director um, as uh, the stage manager of three, uh, sorry, uh, for three years he came to Australia um, and I worked on five master classes for him. So we spent a lot of time together because those master classes are a number of days, plus there's the uh, communication beforehand, setting up um, you know, casting the scenes, etc. Mm. Uh, and I started out with Larry just being a fan like everybody else and being in mild awe. It wasn't mild, it yeah. was just awe. Yeah. Um, uh, getting him to sign my, uh, my book and, uh, and then we developed a friendship very quite, quite quickly and I, over the next couple of years that he came out, um, we had a, a strong collegial um, relationship 
and and he was a real mentor to me wow. and I started to do this because of Larry wow. I started to teach acting um, through um, through his inspiration um, I didn't teach di acting directly because I didn't feel I was qualified to but I uh, served as dramaturg for a number of acting teachers, including Noni Hazelhurst. But and it was from those classes that people started asking me to direct. And so each year, the the two years following Larry first coming out, uh, I had done more and more um, pr projects. Um, and that is what really inspires Larry. He's he he is an inspirational man who wants to be inspired. Mm. That that his words are not just empty calories and I think it's it's great for people to go along and feel the passion of other people and other educators it's great but you've got to put that into process and I think Larry saw that he had ignited something genuine in me I was putting things into action I wasn't just taking the injection of inspiration and you know feeling good I went out and I did stuff with that we, he came out in 2013 we had a lot to do with each other in that um, that time, um, a lot of a lot more kind of informal hanging out, chatting, dinners, discussing things that we love, uh, and then nine months later, I get a an email out of the blue from the Australian Theatre Company in LA, um, saying, uh, introducing themselves, and saying that uh, Larry had asked for me specifically to assistant direct. Um, holding the man with him because he was going to be away for um, a couple of weeks during the rehearsal process and he wouldn't trust anyone else except for me to to take those um, and so basically you know it was put to me that we cannot have a show unless you say yes to this <laughs> so, uh, oh. which was very humbling incredible incredibly humbling and then I got to work with the person who had been my inspiration and my mentor we got to collaborate together uh, as his assistant director um, obviously I uh, didn't have, I couldn't improve upon his script analysis, which is uh, <laughs> what he is known for. I'm pretty good at it as well, but I'm not going to claim anywhere near the uh, parallel uh, to, to Larry Moss. Uh, so I worked um, the, my version of the kind of Mike Lee-ish process, um, basically a, a long form improv with, um, with the cast uh, while he was busy doing uh, master classes and on set of films. Uh, I, I worked with uh, the actors about a year and a half later. They asked me to then do their, um, to be part of their season when they uh, followed up and did their second and third productions back to back. I've had some very um, big blessings in the return to my career, as I said, as a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when I came back into the industry, um, but I came back into an industry that I'd long since closed the door on. Mm -hmm. And when I returned to it, I was working with some of the world's best and Australia's best um, very, very quickly. And I've had a lot of um, guardian angels in that. Yeah, if and you're in the right place, you're in the right place. Yeah. You've mentioned the word dramaturgy a few times. Can you tell us about what a dramaturge does? Dramaturgy is just a fancy pants way of saying analysis. Um, Oh, I know a lot of people that where I trained would kill me for saying that, but to me, it's I, I'm about demystification. Dramaturgy is the particular type of analysis and critical eye that we use in the theatre and in actor training and uh, and the arts, the dramatic arts, um, to talk about what it is that we do. Um, so it's different from literary. Um, criticism or art history or it's particular to the theatre and it's uh, it can be something to do with performance it can do with the writing um, but it's it's the way of it's the language uh, of uh, creating and analyzing um, theatre and drama so give me an example you you directed stupid fucking bird yes which is a wonderful production yeah, thank, thank you, you. Um, <laughs> And so what would a dramaturge have done for you on that production? Well, uh, so there's, uh, there's two questions there in a way. Um, so uh, dramaturg or dramaturge um, is a role that some um, theatres have or some people assign themselves that role and they can, be, um, they can work with a theatre company. Um, and it's a multivariate role. Sometimes it's a 
can be a sort of literary manager, sometimes it's a, a script analyst, sometimes it's just somebody offering information. The verb form or, uh, to, to offer dramaturgy um, is that analysis that I was talking about. So dramaturgy can be employed by um, that's not a verb, is it? It's a noun. Um, it's an abstract noun, dramaturgy. Um, is um, the, uh, anyone in the production can use and any, any audience can use, anybody uses it when they um, analyse um, and break down something that is theatrical in, in nature. So, so it's really like a script analysis, basically script analysis? It can be, but it's also performance analysis. Yep. It can be editing if you're right. talking about film. So dramaturgy is just like, if you were talking to, uh, in this, and this is my opinion of it, it's a very slippery term, okay. but it's, for me, um, dramaturgy, to help simplify it, it, it is anytime you're analysing a um, theatrical, dramatic um, text, mm -hmm. you are employing some form of dramaturgy in order okay. to unpack the ideas and the way in which it creates meaning. And it differs from pure literary criticism or script analysis because script analysis is part of dramaturgy. I would mm -hmm. say that script analysis is a tool within the dramaturgy, which could also be looking at the lighting, the set design, the, uh, the style of acting. It's a much bigger, broader umbrella term. A dramaturg or dramaturge is somebody whose role it is to fulfill one of those specific roles okay. on a What's next? What are you doing now, Peter? What's next for you? Um, so I'm taking on the very exciting, uh, somewhat daunting task of uh, directing three plays concurrently. How, how can you do that? I know, it's exciting, right? Um, I, Seriously, are you going to sleep? I don't know. I, it's, I, <laughs> it's an experiment. I haven't done it before. Um, I, but as an acting teacher, I'm often in a number of different texts at any one time. Um, and I don't have many settings. I'm sort of on and off kind of guy. So when I'm directing um, or working with actors on their showcase pieces, I'm working like it's a production anyway. And I um, did the second year um, showcase for the National Theatre Drama School last year. We were working on three texts kind of concurrently then mm -hmm. at, at the same time I was working on the Trial of Dorian Gray, which we just had a great success at Midsummer Festival. Um, so I kind of have gone, the, it's not, I don't feel, um, I don't feel like it's too much for me to handle, um, but it's certainly an experiment because I've never done three productions that are going to have a season each concurrently. Three productions, they're all going to be on at the same time. A similar time, yeah, so uh, two are on will have crossover seasons and one's in July so it's it's about three weeks later but the rehearsal process and all the kind of pre-production stuff is all at the same time um, but yeah they're three completely different companies um, three radically different plays uh, please tell me one of them's a light one one of them's lightish <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's about love and it's an exploration <laughs> of love it's called almost Maine. it's a wonderful play and it's, it is a wonderful um, play it's postmodern um, in a loose sense so it's um, it's not all the um, chocolates and roses forms of love, um, but it is an un unusual for me because I did get to the end of it and go, no one dies, no one's <laughs> murdered, nobody's you know horribly mutilated. Okay, um, no, it was fantastic, um, and um, that was the last one that came to me. I, I knew that I was doing the other two before that, and I really wanted to say no to it because I I'm, I'm not insane. The company did a reading for me. Um, to say, come on, please come on board. And I just, I realised that I had to do it because I, um, yeah, I didn't want someone else to do it and um, make it twee because I think it has the, um, I think it's a really great play. Um, I'm doing uh, yeah, a couple of other plays. One is set in World War One, and the other one is about a serial killer. So much more my normal milieu. Mm, <laughs> mm. So where are they going to be on, and what's two of them are at the Meat Market uh, in North Melbourne. Two completely different productions, um, but just happened to get that venue. It's becoming a bit of an up and coming venue. Um, almost Maine. The other one is called You Are the Blood, um, and that's a new play right out of America. Um, it's a team of s called Spinning Plates, uh, Almost Maine, which will be on in June, uh, that is by Between the Buildings, who are a group that formed um, out of 16th Street Actors Studio. They're um, all recent grads um, of that. 
I often work with um, grads, and one is a, um, a production, a theatre school production. Um, so that one will be, um, that's going to be at the Alex Theatre. And yeah, it's going to be great. Hopefully, if they if they go well, there's no you know, could look fantastic three plays. So one of the things with doing theatre is because there's often a long time between gigs, you just start to get a little bit of traction, and then you've got to wait six months before mm. something happens. And people have got to hold it. This time, m people won't have to hold their attention spans too long to sort of see what I do. <laughs> 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 and three really week and week about. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a it's a long game. Where do you see yourself in five years' time? I don't know. I, I really hope that I am able to consistently make a living as uh, doing what I love. And that's been, you know, one of the great privileges of my life. And one of the th things that I'm most proud of is that I, off I always said when I was an actor um, in my youth, if I can just do this, if I can, I don't care about being rich and famous and anything as long as I can do this um, with my life mm -hmm. um, and I am you know I I'm, I'm would make little young Peter very happy if he knew that I was doing this not as an actor but as a director but I think mm -hmm. he'd still be pretty happy hopefully I get to move a bit more between film television and theatre I want to be able to work across those three media you know I remember Larry who's my uh, Larry Moss my mentor um, saying, you know, success is just getting to work with people who who operate at your level or push you. I think he's going to be right about that. I think he is too. I just hope in five years' time I'm working with um, as, as interesting uh, people as I can and for as often as I can. I'm sure you will. Peter, thank you so much for spending your time with us this afternoon. It's been such a pleasure talking. It's been uh, my pleasure as well. But <coughs> you're more than welcome. Thank you. I've been with Peter Blackburn and this is Ted Tet. Thank you for watching.